Hello guys, this is Adip. Welcome to my channel Movement Science, where I simplify biomechanics with Joe. So if you are new to this channel, consider subscribing. Also check me out on Instagram, where I post pictures of my notes, and the reference time for all the topics that I'm going to cover will be mentioned down in the description. So check that out, and let's get started. In this video, we are going to talk about the volar wrist muscles. That is basically the flexors of your wrist joint. So we have six muscles totally, and two of them pass above your wrist joint. That is your flexor carpi ulnaris and your palmaris longus. When I say above, it means above the flexor retinaculum that is present at the wrist joint. First thing that we need to know are the three main functions. That is basically the stability, the force that is created. and what is length tension relationship now stability first when you want to create movement at your fingers your wrist has to be stabilized and this is provided by your wrist flexors and extensors as well second they generate the force of your finger flexion as well as force needed to create a flexion at the wrist joint and then the third thing is the length tension relationship in simple words your length and your tension that is basically the force that is generated are related meaning if your muscle is in a shortened position it is very hard for your shortened muscle to create force but if it's in a lengthened position if i stretch it at the wrist joint it can create force very effectively at the fingers depending on the length of the muscle the how much force it will generate can be affected so now that we have understood this concept let's move on to each muscle first is the flexor carpi radialis now radialis so obviously it's on the radial side near the thumb so if you can see over here this red one is the flexor carpi radialis and this black dot that you can see is the axis of the wrist joint around which radial and ulnar deviation happens now because it is on the radial side it obviously causes radial deviation but if you can see it is very close to the axis right so it is not very efficient at producing that radial deviation So now if we go to what I've written over here it is its primary action is flexion at the wrist joint obviously because it is on the front side and along with flexion it also causes radial deviation but because it is very close to the axis it is not very efficient at doing it right so what happens is the extensor carpi radialis it works with extensor carpi radialis longus to create that radial deviation or you can say it offsets the extension produced by the muscle what do i mean by this i'll explain now so what you can see over here on the most radial side is your flexor carpi radialis okay over here so that will create your wrist flexion and radial deviation towards the thumb right this movement and what it will do with your extensor is when extensor will create your extension and radial deviation along with that this will create flexion and radial deviation and both will cancel out and a pure radial deviation movement will be seen so that is your flexor carpi radialis moving on to the next muscle there is flexor carpi ulnaris now this is on the ulnar side of your wrist joint and the primary action of this is also flexion at the wrist joint and where it is attached is hamate and the fifth mcp now let us look at the bones So over here if you can see this is your thumb right and this is your scaphoid so she looks too pretty p pisiform is over here and try to catch her hamate is over here so it comes from the ulnar side it attaches to your hamate over here right and your fifth metacarpal so that's where it attaches and then it also envelops your pisiform you can see the pisiform over here so it goes over the pisiform and attaches to two bones over here now what does pisiform do it pushes the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris even away from your axis of rotation right see if you can see this is the axis of rotation flexor carpi ulnaris over over here now because of the pisiform it gets pushed even more outward which makes it more efficient right so that's what i mentioned here it increases the moment arm the tendon is placed in such a way that it is away from your axis which increases the force production and the movement that is created correct at your ulnar region right the ulnar deviation 
and this has a good functional relevance because when you are chopping something you will be using the flexor carpi ulnaris on this side to generate that force correct so chopping of wood is something this muscle will be used at now what you can see over here is your flexor carpi ulnaris because it is on the ulnar side and you can see this would be the axis right and around this axis the ulnar deviation will be happening in this side so that time you can see this muscle is firing and it crosses above the flexor retinaculum it does not go underneath it goes above it another thing about the flexor carpi ulnaris is it will go over here right so if you can see the bones there is your pisiform bone over here right so it will go above the pisiform bone right over here so it will increase the momentum over here so that ulnar deviation happens more efficiently by attaching at the hamate and the fifth mcp over here right fifth mcp and the hamate now i have mentioned about where it is attaching over here but other muscles i won't really go into the depths of the insertion in origin because then it will make the video too long so if you guys want to brush up on the anatomy you can go check out some anatomy videos next is your flexor digitorum profundus now this is a very long deep muscle running and in your forearm and going from your wrist joint all the phalanx and inserts into the distal phalanx right and what this does is it's a flexor of your fingers along with your wrist flexor and the active and passive insufficiency rule applies really well over here when you are talking about this muscle now what do you mean by active and passive insufficiency active insufficiency means when your muscle right profundus is already contracted at one region it is very hard for it to generate force at another region throughout its course and passive insufficiency means when it is stretched at one region it is very hard for it to stretch at another region along its course so that's what your active and passive insufficiency means next going to the flexor digitorum superficialis again it causes flexion at the fingers and the wrist but it is more of a wrist flexor compared to a more of a finger flexor whereas digitorum profundus the deep muscle is more of a finger flexor it is again a multi joint muscle it crosses lot of joints in your hand and along with the help of your extensor it stabilizes your wrist joint the action can vary with radial and ulnar deviation so the flexion that is created would be the primary movement but its action can slightly vary based on what position your wrist is placed in right if it's in more of ulnar deviation it will assist in flexion in that ulnar deviation position now this muscle in the center you can see is your flexor digitorum superficialis and right underneath it will be the flexor digitorum profundus which is the deep muscle so flexor digitorum superficialis you can see it's a pretty thick tendon and it will go and spread like this in your hand so that is your flexor digitorum superficialis whose main action is flexion at the wrist now final two muscles there is the flexor pollicis longus simple pollicis is thumb right so it causes flexion of the thumb and since it is on the radial side it can also cause radial deviation if it's stabilized well enough whereas palmaris longus is more of an extra muscle that we have its primary action is flexion and it is seen that it is absent unilaterally or bilaterally in 14% of your population so it's kind of a useless muscle you don't really use it that much and it can be used or sacrificed i can say for surgery to take a tendon or a tendon graft for using it when there is a tendon or some other kind of injury right so that's when palmaris longus can be used now just besides your radialis you can see another thin tendon that is your flexor pollicis longus now this tendon will go like this and attach into your thumb to create flexion of the thumb right and because it is on the radial side if it is stabilized properly it can also cause radial deviation and just besides the tendon you can see this yellow structure going that is your median nerve it will go underneath your flexor retinaculum and a superficial branch will go over it so these are your volar wrist muscles or the flexors of your wrist joint now this flexor retinaculum what it does is all the tendons are going it covers all the tendons so that it prevents the bow stringing of the tendons because tendons have to generate the force right and they can generate the force only if they are stabilized over here otherwise there will be bow stringing they'll come out of place and 
and this is prevented by your flexor retinaculum. Along with flexor retinaculum, there is another small black band you can see that is the TCL that is the transverse carpal ligament which is seen along with your flexor retinaculum. So now that we have covered all the muscles, let's quickly summarize. There is flexor carpi radialis which causes flexion and radial deviation. Flexor carpi ulnaris which causes flexion and ulnar deviation. Flexor digitorum superficialis which is more of a wrist flexor. And flexor digitorum profundus which is more of a finger flexor. Then there is the flexor pollicis longus which is flexor of the thumb and also can cause radial deviation sometimes and a palmaris longus which is flexor of the wrist which can be sacrificed in some surgeries. So with that we finish off this topic. That's all for today guys. Thank you for watching. If you like my content please like share and subscribe to the channel. It will really help me out and thank you for watching.